Post your failures because it will teach people that success is possible. It's not fabricated. It wasn't handed to you. I'm still failing to this day. You know, and it's a great learning point. Don't just go from, I was in the hood and now I've got a Ferrari. Post those failures so that people understand the steps in the process. So they're not just chasing the Ferrari. Post the failures. That's the stepping stones to success right there. Jamie, how are you, sir? Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank not you for having at all. Me. Thanks for doing this. No, not a problem. Not a problem. It's, uh, I've checked you out. It's a great show. So I was excited to come on here. Well, we're excited to have you. And I really like your podcast. Um, we need to talk about Minecart, this fantastic new app that you've founded um, and what your journey is to reach the point where you put this together and all of the other really fascinating work you do around mental well-being. But um, we do guest rider on the podcast. Uh, we're keeping it nice and simple today with a decaffeinated coffee and some oat milk. So you must tell me, Jamie, the oat milk, is that just a taste issue? Is it a vegan issue? Where, where does that come from? Yeah, do you know what? Oh, now you're asking. Uh, I took a time, I think two, 12 months to 18 months. I didn't do meat and then I didn't do dairy. I just trying it yeah. and um, just seeing what health benefits were from it. And I quite liked the oat milk. I watched a couple of documentaries on dairy milk as well, and I, it, it shocked me. So, yeah, there was nothing, you know, I'm not a vegan or anything like that, but I do try different things for, for health benefits, and it's better than alcohol, you know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm trying to stay off the alcohol at the minute, so. And what did, just from, be really interested to know, did you did you see any specific benefits from, say, the, the um, well, if it was a vegetarian or a vegan? Yeah, so what I learned on my journey, um, I'm really big on, I drink a lot of water now. I never used to. And I, I know there's a lot of health benefits from that. And it's really improved my quality of life, I think. I learned about meat being that it uses up a lot of the water in your body to digest it. Whereas when I was eating vegetarian predominantly, I was doing a lot more fruit, a lot more vegetables. I was conscious of my healthy eating, including the snacks I was having as well. So I, I cut out a lot of the cakes. I was like, well, why am I eating all this? vegetables and fruit but I'm now eating all these cakes so it just made me more health conscious to be honest uh, it was a difficult journey though just trying to find what type of things to eat that yeah. was the hardest part you know I, I mean I think the other thing with, with with vegan and vegetarian is it must be a challenge getting all your kind of nutrients in because um, take on board what you say about meat but did you have to do loads of like supplementing with like vitamin B and vitamin D and that sort yeah, of thing? Yeah, I do. I do supplements anyway. Most of the vitamins and mineral stuff, I'm big on the sea moss as well. I think the body's made up of something like 112 minerals, more than it is vitamins. Yeah. And sea moss has got like 96 in it. So I'm big on the sea moss. So yeah, these are just natural supplements. So, so yeah, I, I did take them alongside that. I still take them to this day and I have meat now. So yeah. I t well, I, I, do you know what's interesting? Through COVID, um, I don't think the message about the importance of of good vitamin consumption has really been put out there. Um, of course, all of the rumours are that vitamin D is one of the key ways to get your immunity system boosted up to stop the infection or to fight it off. But I just don't think that message is is, is getting out there really. No, and it's with for me. It's it's not just through this pandemic. It's your health as a whole. Mm. How much do we actually look at our health? And even with the current pandemic and vaccinations and things like that that's all well and good but what do you do anyway to protect your health what do you do anyway to strengthen your immune system do you get some time to go to the gym do you buy good food do you cut back on the cakes or is it an everyday thing for you so sleep well yeah lots you of water. have to look after yeah. yourself you know we only get one body and one shot of this life as far as i know so you need to look after yourself physically as well as mentally well of course this this is a, a really nice segue into into talking about than now because of course your your app that you founded is 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 mine kite and um, this is a, a great app which is a platform for general well-being but it does pull together a number of different facets so you you do have um the physical wellness aspect and physical goals and goals generally running alongside some of the other issues we're going to talk about so i could tell before i met you that this issue of looking after yourself 
and controlling what you can control was was important to you. I couldn't agree with you more. But let's let's go right back then. So you grew up you grew up in Scotland. Was it Glasgow? Grew up in Glasgow. Yeah, and tried what, to anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what was what what was childhood like for you? To be fair, childhood was good. I came from a loving family. So when you come, I think when you come from a loving family, your surroundings it doesn't matter. Most of Glasgow, and I'm not going to highlight any particular areas, but most of Glasgow is living well under the breadline. Yeah. Um, you know, we call it the schemes up there, council estates, um, predominantly council estates, minimum wage, social security, or, or you know, the brew if you like. Um, it's quite common. So yeah, we, we not growing up with everything, but I, I grew up in a loving family, which is, you know, to me, priceless. Yeah. And obviously you became interested in the issue of mental health. What was the the trigger for that? Was it something in particular that you were seeing in Glasgow or, or Surf- just in general? Surviving Glasgow. And it's a great, as I, I, I say this a lot, it's a, Glasgow's a great place for tourists. You see the city centre. Walk five minutes either way from the city centre, you see a whole different picture. And I think that different picture causes, it causes bad moods, it causes anger, there's segregation, separation, there's, a poor mindset and there's a stuck mindset in a lot of places in Glasgow. Generations of poverty and it keeps you stuck there because no one really leaves. No one really, I'm not saying no one, not everyone has the opportunity to get that education past what they can see in front of them. And I think that leads a lot to poor mental health. You've got poor choices of food. You've got poor physical health, which also adds to the poor mental health as well. And it's, Glasgow's at an all-time high, you know, compared to UK and even Europe. Yeah. The um, the issue you specifically noted, um, I was reading, was that this poor mental health that you're describing was the trigger for a really worrying suicide rate. Yeah, so, so Glasgow, and it's still increasing just now, Glasgow has the highest suicide rate in the whole of Europe. It has the highest suicide rate for males between 25 and 42, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and males in the UK, which is astonishing. I come from Glasgow. That's heartbreaking. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm standing here or sitting here today talking to you, not one of those statistics. What can you do to change that? How can you help that? It's your people, you know? And as I looked into Glasgow, I had people reaching out to me from other parts of the UK and I was like well let's not be selfish here let's let's have a look around it's not just Glasgow we're, we're not just the ones we have a high rate but we're not just the ones suffering there's much more of it happening in the UK and now I know the rest of the world as well you know you're right um I mean I was looking at the suicide statistics um and the picture throughout the west um is quite similar the trend is that suicide is worryingly high, but there is, I mean, you mentioned male suicide and, 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 and the fact that it was such a significant cause of death in young men in Glasgow. And certainly that, that's the trend, which, which is crystal clear from what I read. Uh, in the UK, whole of the UK, statistically, men are three times more likely to commit suicide than, than women. Now, every suicide is an absolute tragedy, an absolute waste and a loss. But it seems to me that three times as high is more than just a, a blip in the data. It must signify that something is going on amongst men, Correct. which is leading to these, uh, these statistics of representing people in despair men in despair. Do you have a view on why that statistic, men three times more likely to commit suicide? What's going on there? I'll touch on, I'll touch firstly on the most talked about one, because this will be the one that most people know. And it's men don't talk enough. And in part, that's true. Women get together and they talk a lot. They know they'll, they'll phone a girlfriend about their grievances and things like that. And I understand that that's part of it. My personal opinion, it goes deeper than that because you've, as you've said, they're three times higher. Is it just because we aren't having a conversation? I don't believe that because I've worked in construction sites most of my life, um, been around guys in banter, and I've also been around guys that, 
you know, open up, you know, talk about their girlfriends or what's going on in the household and things like that. So I do think men do talk to an extent. So I don't think it's solely that purpose. One of my personal views is, and again, it's just a personal view, is men apply a lot of different pressures to themselves in society, society pressures. You know, how do they how do they find a life partner? Um, are they are they good enough for these type of life partners? What makes your man is having a nice big fancy car make your man, the flash watch make your man. There's all these outward society pressures that I think I know I've felt it on myself that we we apply this to ourselves. And it only needs to go wrong once and you're in a really bad place. You know, it only needs you only need to feel insufficient once and you're in a really bad place. And I think that's a huge contributing factor to why men um, feel this way or, or start to spiral into depression and then have these attempts or go through with suicide. Um, yeah, that, and that's just a personal view. Yes. I, I have to say that I, that strikes a number of chords with me because, I mean, I've lost at least four... Uh, not close friends over the last couple of years, but they're all male, and that I knew them well enough that it was, you know, really upsetting and, and horrifying that that they decided to take their own life. Let, let's just think about this issue of of, of pressure, because I, I suppose the, the the question which jumps to mind immediately is why is it men who are feeling this pressure, and st- according to the statistics, at least. If that is the cause, women aren't. Um, because, of course, everyone is exposed to the same media, the same social media, the same life pressures, I guess. But you've got those stats which are saying something's gone wrong. What, t- tell me about your views on on this issue of um, the materially men looking perhaps at Instagram yeah. and saying, look at these guys here driving Ferraris. That is what I should be aspiring to, and then becoming uh, disengaged, perhaps in first, and then ultimately in despair if they're not able to fulfil what they see as their goal as a man in life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, social media, definitely, or the misuse—I wouldn't say social media—the misuse or misleading parts of social media or social media use definitely has a contributing factor. But just before that stage, I think that there's a lot of pre-programming that still exists so you know women have the feminine roles in society and males have the masculine roles and it's a fantastic thing i'm all for equality and it's it's absolutely fantastic that we you know we have this equal workforce now or we can have it as able um to occur but i think there's still a lot of men see themselves as the breadwinner and um, there's a lot of that still programmed into us so the male role as to be an alpha still exists but not a lot of men are fulfilling the alpha role and that leaves a problem. Then reinforced by what you see in social media, oh, wait a minute, that your next man has a Ferrari picture, a Lambo picture, even if he's walked by it in the street and took this picture, it still gives that perception. And then you've got that melting pot that adds up. You go, oh, I'm clearly not good enough to get, you know, anybody. And I think a lot of it is to do with relationships and how your life looks compared to other people. Comparison syndrome, I like to call it. I think there's a lot of that. And it affects men heavily because they still see themselves as I need to get to this stage. Whereas I, I don't think, and I may be wrong, but I, women do have comparison syndrome with body shape and things like that. But I think their needs and requirements are different from the male needs and requirements in society. Because if if that's right, if you've got on the one hand, that this I like your word programming, because we rightly talk about um, a leveling off in terms of inequality between the, the sexes. But if if we as men still have this breadwinner, hunter-gatherer, alpha male baked into us, it needs more than just a, um, a trend in society to actually address that. And if if it's not being addressed, if if sort of the message isn't being put out, that it's kind of okay not to be materially um, flamboyant and that actually there's different things about being a fulfilled, purposeful human being, then if we're failing to get that message out there, then I could I could see how someone would go into like a spiral of 
disappointment and confusion and disengagement and then it's depression and despair. Absolutely. But there's also, uh, let me throw a curveball out there. That is one side of it, which is terrible. But I actually think there's also another side. That, so you have a quality now, which I think is great. You have powerful women in business and life without the need to seek a man. So then you've got men who do empower themselves, want to find that type of woman, but not as many of those type of women exist anymore. So your need or your, your the way you've positioned yourself as a man is now diminished because, well, wait a minute, nobody really needs me. I have to look inside myself, make sure I'm enough for myself. And then the walls start falling down that way as well. So there's two sides to that coin. Yeah. And let me, let me just unpack that even further because... I mean, there still isn't equality around like the boardroom table in companies up, up and down the country and up, up and you know around the world. But if more women are reaching positions of power, um, I suppose there's a question about whether they would view um, a, a, a man who perhaps hadn't reached a similar position as as a as an attractive partner is that is that is that your thought process yeah basically what what i mean is if a man is leading by his external attributes powerful job powerful car nice watch if you're leading by that you don't act, sometimes you don't even know who you are yourself strip all that back cuz now you have a, an equal you have an, a woman sitting across from you in a boardroom let's use that as an example she also has a powerful car she has a nice watch she has a nice house you're on a level playing field now your personality has to come out. Now your charm has to come out. Do you have that? Or were you leading by your externals? And if you strip your externals away, and I don't want this to happen to anyone, but you strip your externals away and you're left with someone you don't actually like or know, then you've got a problem. Then your spiral start to happen because you don't, you're not leading with that flashness anymore. Well, that, yeah. And I mean, let's get it right for anyone. That um, flashness and that kind of flamboyant, material goods that, that that is only going to take you so far with with, with, with virtually any yeah. situation because ultimately if you're not an attractive human being then you're going to get found out at, at, and this projects point. from your inside and i say this to a lot of people your your how you look and present yourself comes from projection that's why there's a lot of what society would deem as not so good looking comedians end up with really beautiful women because they project a good personality. Yeah. And that wins over every time. If you're a good person in here, you're good here. And people will see that. A smile can win over a room. No matter what your society says you look like, a smile can win over a heart, you know? And I think that's important. It's people need to go inside themselves sooner. Yeah. And build bricks outwards. I think that's so important. And from the from the statistics we talked about, it would appear that that message isn't being communicated as well to people generally. But we would suggest to men, insofar as if if we're right that one of the causes behind the worry and suicide rate is this false belief that unless they possess what are materially successful attributes that they lack purpose, meaning, and fulfillment. Then the question, I suppose, is how do we go about addressing that? How do we go about making the point you just have, Jamie, which is that your actual, phys your, your, your personal qualities, your qualities as a human, how you can communicate, how you can... Um, demonstrate respect, how you can attract respect, how you can light up a room, all of these really crucial things in why we would want to form a relationship with anyone, if that was a friendship or a romantic relationship or whatever. If that message isn't getting through and we've got people and men in particular out there who are thinking, I don't have either material success or a pathway to that material success, so I lack purpose, I've got no chance and I'm slipping into despair. What are some of the steps you think we can start to take as society to begin to address that? Yeah, I talk a, I talk a lot about gratitude and I see it a lot on my social medias 
and I want to make sure that people are using this right. I, no matter where you are, male or female, what stage you're at in your life, what you have in your life, you need to learn gratitude. If you have gratitude, you have a baseline. No matter how bad your life goes that day, you go back to your gratitude, what you're grateful for. I woke up, I've got a roof over my head. I've got food in the fridge. The kids are healthy. As simple as that sounds, and as boring as it may seem to repeat it, it might save your life one day. Because if you get that to go back to, you'll never go any further down. It's a baseline, I call it. You know, write the down three to five gratitudes every morning. You'll hear some of the top speakers in the world say this. You'll hear some of the top coaches in the world say this. Three to five gratitudes. And before I started doing it, I was like, oh, cause what? You know, it's a lot of, a lot of nonsense. But it's not. It gives you that baseline to return to. So if you are a powerful man, powerful woman, and all your facets and assets are stripped away from you, nah, I've still got my gratitudes. Still got the things that really matter to me that are me, that are my core. And does that bring us on to, um, I suppose we can we can touch on um, mind kite at this point, because I, from my perception for, for checking out the app, I think this almost is the is is the platform that you, you, your baseline that you mentioned in app form because um, well for, perhaps first of all before I offer any more views on it do you, do you want to just tell everyone what Mindkite is and 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 why you decided to found it Yeah, so Mindkite is a positivity driven community. We make content that you should be consuming, positive, motivational inspirational content, educational content as well, but done in a done in a fun way and a good way that will you know, it'll keep you coming back again. The app in particular, we have a podcast, we have a YouTube channel as well, but the app in particular has got a positivity driven news feed. You'll select a happy face or sad face and then your comment, whatever it may be. I always use an example, happy face, got a new job today. Everyone else in that community will reinforce that, that joy with you, you know? Sad face, I've lost my job today. You'll get a wave of comments. Don't worry, there's another job around the corner and things like that. There's no adverts, there's no comparison. You're all equal on the app. Then we have a vision board, a digital vision board. You can put 12 of your biggest dreams on there, which means you're going to see them every day. And if you can see them every day, you'll be a step closer to achieving them. We also have the gratitude diary. So your daily, weekly and monthly goals. And it asks you to put in three gratitudes every time you're in the diary that keeps reinforcing what are you grateful for you're living you're breathing what are you grateful for and then we've got a whole bunch of well-being content yoga meditation small at home workouts we've got educational mental health content and we've got a whole bunch of interviews and podcasts on there as well so it's your one-stop shop for your daily motivation that as someone actually once said it's like your personal assistant for your mind yeah and it is all it, it's i mean it's the app is very user friendly. It's very easy to negotiate. It's very clear. Just tell me, talk, just talk me back to this positive news feed. Yeah. Because when I first heard that, I thought, have you found a way of sort of filleting the news to only bring through onto the app the stories in the news, which are positive? But is it more of a a community of who are commenting? Yeah, absolutely. So what you what you're trying to do with that type of um with that type of content that Mindkite creates. I mean, before the app was even launched, we made a whole series of content with our team and put it out to the world so people know who Mindkite is and what we stand for and our core values. So when you download the app and go into the app, you're with like-minded people. So even if your conversation's good or your conversation's bad, you'll have the the decent outcome that you should get. Whereas there's other social media platforms out there that are a bit more free for all. You've got all different ranges of mindsets that are not all striving for the same types of outcome in life. And I mean that like as in a mindset outcome, not a material outcome. So why not join a community of your type of people? Whether you're unhappy and want to become happy or whether you're happy and just want to maintain that, you know? And would you, um, if we think of, the positivity news feed as a social media platform or a social community platform, which I, I think is fundamentally what the likes of Facebook and, and and Instagram are. Would your advice to anyone using Mindkite be use this news feed, 
and close your Facebook and Instagram accounts down? Absolutely not. What I've always said is, and those guys you mentioned are, are, are the big boys, and uh, shout out Mark Zuckerberg, if you want to come and talk to me, by all means, I'll have that conversation because we have something special. So basically what I want to do with that is be the alternative. Come here, use our app, give yourself 10 minutes a break, you know, and then go and do whatever you do. Hopefully by doing that, what you'll see is good, positive, motivational, inspirational energy. And then you'll decide when you go back to your main big boy, you know, apps like Instagram and Facebook, you will go, do you know what? I'm going to delete a few people and a few things off here because they that doesn't serve me any longer. And I'm going to start adding people that have got something to say that, you know, penetrates and 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 hits my soul in a way that I enjoy and I like, that make me feel good at the end of the day, rather than seeing a whole bunch of stuff that ends up making you feel terrible, you know? Yeah, there is a bit of that on normal social media, isn't it? Is, is this issue of, of the pylons, which I, I just can't stand? Um, and what I mean by that is that, um, there does seem to be sometimes if someone does something wrong, if someone says the wrong thing or they exercise poor judgment or they make a mistake in their, their life, which becomes public for, for whatever reason, there is this um, almost joy that a large volume of people at times take in impiling onto the person as if that serves some sort of positive outcome. I mean, I've got to say, I struggle to see anything positive about it. Yeah, there's no, I, I don't believe it and I know exactly what you're talking about. And I think that's why we engineered that newsfeed to be that way. Pick your happy or sad face, are you happy or sad? Let the community know and we'll bring you back up again. And if you're happy, we'll clap for you. If you're sad, we'll bring you up. And I think that's what it needs. And, this comes down to what you consume. You can make a choice on all other platforms of who you look at, of what you consume. But I think there's a bunch of people out there that use these platforms to make themselves feel better by making other people feel bad and jumping on those type of bandwagons. And actually, sometimes there's people that do it unintentionally. They see a whole bunch of people saying some things and then they'll jump on and put their little bit in, which is a pile on and it's a pressure. And you never know how the person at the other end, the receiving end of that, is actually going to react to that. Not everybody's built to take that. They're Whether not. you're in the public eye or not, not everyone's built to take that. But we're all human at the end of the day. That's right. And I mean, I've I've heard, um, I mean, we, we could quote a number of um, instances where this has happened. Um, I mean, in fact, let me think now. What was the one the other day? Oh, there's been a parliamentary debate about this, hasn't there? Um, and uh, Rio Ferdinand was talking about this issue of racist abuse that the players have to endure online. I'm trying, I, I know who it was. The lady's name escapes me. I think she won Love Island. And she was on talking about getting death threats from like 14 year olds. And about, you know, a dreadful period of her life where she had to endure this. I think you're right. You know, Jamie, I mean, I struggle to imagine what it must be like to have a period of time where, like the majority, social media, your postings, your checkings, uh, you, you're getting yourself up to date, is a part of your day. And then all of a sudden you become the subject of one of these pylons. I can't imagine the pressure and the stress that that would create on someone. I could see it driving someone into despair. It does and it has. There's, just, there's countless people that have suffered at the hands of social media and media pressure and seen their downfall or what any depression or, or worse committed, committed suicide. But what we really need to look at there is also, if you're at the receiving end of that, step away. You have the power. Your phone, most people are using a phone or a laptop and you know, an electrical device, tablet or such like. Put it down. Yeah. You actually literally have the control to step away from it. It's when you become engaged in it. Then when the pylon comes, you be you're absolutely consumed by it. You're overwhelmed like a tsunami coming over you. Step away before that. Step away. It's only it's only words and I think now, 
and I seen this. It was a, it's, I don't know if you know the guy, Sad Guru. He's like an Indian guru. He does a lot of motivational stuff and inspirational speaking, but he does it so naturally and so well. And he talks about the way we use words now or the way we receive words. They're like bullets, but they can only hurt us that way if we accept it like a bullet. Word is just a word. And what he describes is, he says, well, imagine I'm smiling and laughing to you and speaking in a different language. You'll smile and laugh back thinking I'm, I'm really complimenting you, but I could be saying the most horrible things. But you receive it in a nice way. So you're okay, you're happy and you leave. So it's how we receive those words. If we can turn off from them and just go, they're only words, they're not bullets. They can't penetrate us unless we let them in. I agree with you, but just playing devil's advocate for a, for a moment, this issue of your digital reputation, in recent years, its importance seems to have skyrocketed. Let me let, let me just give you an, an example. I like a podcast, a US podcast, which uh, Sam Harris does. Uh, it's it's a mindfulness podcast, actually. He's he, he's a neuroscientist, but he's he's quite a. Um, I'll use the word I'll use the word uh, outspoken. That's not a great word, but he's certainly someone who has strong views on a number of key issues. So his podcast is quite political. It's quite issue driven. He has been known to have some real conflict with guests sometimes. I, I was listening to one of his podcasts the other day, and what some people do maliciously is they uh, falsely edit clips of his podcast to make it look like he said things he hasn't. And then, of course, that, get, got, that gets posted on Twitter, and people absolutely in their tens of thousands pile on, and then you get people saying, no, that wasn't what happened, etc. And... When I was listening to that, I was thinking, well, if the sticks and stones argument is right, which that resonates a lot with me, by the way, in terms of, you know, they are just words. But I, I wonder whether we're at a stage now where they're more than just words, where words can damage your digital reputation. And we have heard, haven't we, of people losing jobs over something they've tweeted, or perhaps something they haven't tweeted, something which has been said about them on Twitter or another social media platform. So do you think we're at a stage where we need perhaps to reassess the potential damage that's caused by malicious words? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll stick to what I said, you know, words that aren't, aren't bullets, but people misusing these platforms and certain things a certain way, yes. But we also need to remember we have to come into this world with our eyes open. When we enter into a digital space, we have to be comfortable with everything we put out because it may get chopped up and edited. We may end up a meme. We have to be conscious that these things happen and exist. And some people are fantastic. I mean, I've seen the funniest of memes. I'm sure at someone else's expense. There's a layer to it. But we have to, we have to be sure that we are happy with the content we put out and we do know that there may come a time where these circumstances change or the message change that we maybe meant to say. I mean, you're, you're, you're on a podcast show. I do a podcast show as well. We may come into a time where a guest says something or we say something in conversation that the viewing public don't quite agree with. And then that could be our day in the, in the dock, if you like, you know. Um, but we have to be aware of that beforehand. That, and that goes to accountability, doesn't it? Yes. Now, the reason why, because I agree with you, I don't think you should post something which you wouldn't shout walking down the street. Yeah. Because ultimately, you are shouting it down the street. It's, in fact, it's louder than that because the whole world can hear it. I, one of my biggest bugbears, and particularly bearing in mind this issue, that um, misused words and content, et cetera, can cause this severe impact on individuals which can lead to bad mental health and people have committed suicide over social media um, pylons. The biggest issue I have got is this one of anonymity because if you look, for example, at the um, what Rio Ferdinand was talking about in the select committee, these constant pylons with footballers, the three lads who missed pens for England in the uh, European yeah. Championships, yeah. I think it was something like 70% of the postings which were identified as racist were from accounts which were clearly unverified. They were yep. blag accounts, yep. effectively. 
And it seems to me that your excellent point on be accountable can't be brought to bear when people clearly aren't accountable because there's an egg on their Twitter profile or it's a black name and all the rest of it. Do you think that's an issue, the anonymity um, problem, lack of verified identity, which we need now to be addressing? Yeah, and that that also came up there when you're talking about the, the parliamentary debates. I actually spoke to someone on the old party parliamentary group as well because I have a lot of views on social media and how it should be used in the consumption. And that is one of the things we need to verify ourselves. We do it on on lesser platforms that we don't use as often. Holiday they ask, websites. They ask, yeah, they ask for our passport details, our yep. driving licenses, verification of who we are. I truthfully believe that we have to do that on social media platforms. I don't know why we don't. It's another part of data for them, which is what they are into collecting. And it wouldn't be a problem for us if you're using something like you use your car on a daily basis. You need a license. You'll go and get your photo card made up. Why wouldn't you put your passport into a social media platform if you are using it in the correct way? That makes sense to me. Um, let's just touch on this point of why aren't they doing it. When I heard Jack Dorsey, who's the CEO of Twitter, talking about it, when this was put to him, he said, it's very important that we have the ability to retain anonymity on social media platforms because it's key for whistleblowing. So for example, if you've got an employee of a big corporate who is subjecting workers to poor conditions, who maybe has unsafe working practices, who is producing its um, devices, whatever they are, in a way which are unsafe, there needs to be a way for people to whistleblow at scale, which cannot be done without anonymity. What was, what's your gut reaction to that? I understand that. I think it's in, in the politest way possible, a bit of a cop out, because if you look at the other side of that, you have mass grooming. Let, let's just go there. So you've got mass grooming on social media. You've got people out there intently trying to find youngers and minors. Is that not a bigger problem than somebody having to blow the whistle, which they could go to the national newspapers, they could go other places. Active social media grooming's on social media. You don't need social media to be a whistleblower. You have papers, radios, podcasts, your voice. You have many other means. A poor 13-year-old girl on social media doesn't. I agree with you. And to push it, because um, what you're talking there, isn't it? It's like a balance, balance between the risks presented by people not being able to whistle blow on social media by all of these other risks that we're talking about, mental health, suicide, grooming, abuse. And it's very hard to, to, to suggest that that second problem isn't an awful lot more of a concern than a lack of whistleblowing. It, complete, it completely outweighs it. And, and I'll, I would challenge anybody to, to truthfully win that argument and tell me different. It completely outweighs it. So... There's, I'm sure there's pros for these platforms and other aspects that we don't know about. You know, the more people that sign up, is it the more data they get and the more email addresses they're collecting? Is it a flip side to their benefiting from these anon anonymous accounts? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm going to... The numbers and the stats higher for a start. Well, that, I mean, that's my suspicion. The, the, uh, because it, it would technologically, obviously one of the things my group does is tech. And it would not be that difficult to sort this problem out. It would be a big operational exercise. But the tech is out there because other businesses use it. Banks, insurers, holiday companies, um, government organizations, you need to verify your identity before you get an account. It's not that difficult. And they could set a time scale and they could have a point that unless you've verified your identity by this point, you're off. Now, I suspect that it is commercially driven, that... The, those who invest in ads on these uh, platforms would take a certain view about the membership dropping. Yeah. But it's such a nonsense, isn't it? Because these aren't real people. Well, for example, if I'm using, if I'm using a social media account, I can actually use a different name and a different picture. Even if I was to give, even if there was a system for my passport and things like that, you could still do that. If you wanted to be anonymous, you still could. And under data protection, the person you blew the whistle on wouldn't know it was essentially you. So that kind of blows what they're saying out the water. Is that possible, is it? 
to do that? Yeah, of course. Well, look at Instagram, for example. You can change your name to anything you want. You can no. change your picture to anything you want. All you would be doing was verifying if the police came and said, we suspect that account 005 is doing something illegal or, or you know, untoward or abused someone, racially or verbally or whatever it may be. And then they go, okay, data protection says the police are here. We'll look that up and we'll give you that information. That's all. And what you say in there is that from the perspective of what they're communicating, if there's a case, they can retain a degree of anonymity, but they've still got that accountability. Yes. Because if they transgress, then the social media platform hasn't got to start trying to work out what IP address they're, they're communicating from. They can locate the Correct. verified identity. Correct. And they can still, I mean, they can still do the, they can still do the whistleblowing. Change the name, Absolutely. change the picture. Still do the whistleblowing. No one knows other than the data protected entry point where you've put your details. We're on the same page, aren't we? I'm going to reach out and I'm, I'm going to say, um, I don't know if the likes of Mark Zuckerberg or uh, or Jack Dorsey want to come and visit us here in Liverpool. For, but if particularly if these social media platforms, which I'm sure they do have, have UK based senior representatives, I would love to have them on here and to actually learn more about what all the practical or ethical barriers are in the way to sort this out because I'm sick and tired of the unfairness that is brought to bear by people being able to say whatever they want without accountability. And I think we're in, we're in a terrible place to even start thinking about things like censoring people whose identity is clear. Because even they, even if they're saying awful things, I bet some of these people are hiding in the fodder. They're hiding amongst the noise of anonymity. And if you took that away, they might keep the mouth shut as well. Yeah, and what, what it will do is it will encourage better, better usage, and then that gives you better content to consume. And if you're in an environment of better content, you'll generally populate better content yourself. You won't get immersed in the nonsense. And I think that's what just needs a slight nudge. Doesn't need much. As you said, you work for a tech company. It could be quite easily solved. So I think we just need to forcefully nudge it in the right direction. And linking it back to Minekite and, and the great work you do, you're, I mean, th th this cause that you're pursuing around um, addressing well-being and particularly this, this problem of suicide, I would think this was a really positive step. It's a real opportunity to, to sort of drive good behaviours online. You know, pro, you know, positive, productive behaviours which which promote and increase well-being through the establishment of accountability. So I can see nothing but opportunity and uh, and, and good news from pursuing this. So. I mean, I, I don't know what the outcome of this select committee is going to be that was that was this week and last week, I think. Certainly, you know, we're going to use this podcast and this fantastic discussion we're having just to try and reach out and say, well, can we bring a social media agency, one of these platforms, to, to this discussion? Because I've got to say, this issue is, is cropping up in virtually every podcast because... It's everywhere. This social media is 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 part of the fabric of our society, and if people are suffering um, adverse effects to their well being, if people are becoming depressed, if people are becoming anxious, and if people are becoming suicidal because of the way social media is operating, well, what greater importance can you place on anything, frankly? Yeah, and that that's why we created that platform because. We, my whole team do some separate coaching and one to ones outside, you know, outside the digital space. But people live in the palm of their hand. They live in tablets, laptops, and phones. So I don't want to go into battles and have to. How long will it take us to make a change in the actual social media world that is just now? How long will it take us to alter the media world as a whole? Nah, instead of trying to. You know, you can still battle that on the side, but instead of going full force battle on that and getting nothing done for 10 years, just created a platform. There's just yeah. a, there's an alternative platform. And that was me. Don't try and take phones out of people's hands. Don't bar people from what they already are very used to. 
just give them something else they can actually look at and go, oh, do you know what? This is this is where I need to be. This is right. Yes, it's driving that positive behaviour again, isn't it? It's saying this isn't the only way. And and the fact that you've managed to set up this positivity news feed from scratch, I think is a real achievement. And and, and I love the other social media platforms. I love Facebook. I love Instagram. I'm never off it. I'm there every day. I'm posting stories and stuff like that as well. But I nip on my app. I use that for you know, yeah. five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day. I get mine and then I go, right, I'm good. Centering myself. Now what am I going to go and look at on Instagram? And anyone that's kind of used or seen my Instagram or goes on after this and sees my Instagram, everything on it's positive or or well-being or in good jest. There's nothing bad in there. And that's what I consume on a daily basis as well. If I even come across anything, I'm like, re delete, remove. The thing I really like about your content is it's... and. and your messages generally when I've heard you speak is you, you're, you're very direct and you approach it from a position of um, very can-do attitude. You're not, um, it doesn't, what the, your content doesn't conform to, I think, the traditional, very uh, passive therapeutic messages that I think sometimes can, can could fall on deaf ears. I think sometimes you're giving people a bit of a positive shake and say, you know, you can do this. It's in your hands. Yeah. And I'm speaking from experience. I come from nothing. I'll leave this world with nothing. I, I, I literally, you know, come from hardship. So coming for that hardship and starting to achieve in life, you need to be told and directed and shown that it can be you also. Why not? As my team say, we say, why not? Why not you? Why can't it be you? So that needs to be delivered in a way. And yeah, I listen to some nice stuff. I listen to the soft-spoken stuff as well. But sometimes you need wobbled. You need a shake and someone just to tell you, get up off your butt and do it. You yeah. know, it it's possible, even if you're making one step a day towards what you want to achieve in life, it's doable. If I can do it, believe me, anyone could do it. And it's a cliche saying, but, but I did come from hardship. So if I can do it, anyone can do it. And that's that the issue of role models, the issue of people seeing that it's possible. I mean, that's that that's one of the key um, triggers to people gathering that self belief, because words and sort of a textbook approach are fine, but you can't beat looking at someone and saying, "She looks like me," "He talks like me." She's walked the same streets as me. Her parents did the same thing as me. Um, and if they've done it, why can't I? So this, this issue of establishing more role models and giving people a clearer pathway to success is something we talk a lot about on the podcast. And I think we need more of that. We need to be celebrating those who've Absolutely. managed to pull it off. And do you know what else I've, I'm really, really big on my whole team is? Post your failures. Yeah. Because it will teach people that success is possible, it's not fabricated, it wasn't handed to you. I've, I've still failing to this day, you know, and it's a great learning point. Post them though. Don't just go from, I was in the hood and now I've got a Ferrari. Post those failures so that people understand the steps in the process so they're not just chasing the Ferrari and being completely upset and, and um, dismembered almost when it comes to failure or their first failure and then they turn back. Post the failures. That's the stepping stones to success right there. It is. And do you know what? I mean, I've stopped it because I fail every week, probably every day in, in business. And we say things wrong. We do things wrong. We misjudge things. We maybe fail in our communication with family or we fail to prioritize it. But it's not really failure, is it? It's learning. And I think this, back, back to kind of where we started, when people get driven into a position of despair, my impression is it's because they view a failure as only being about them, that they are both the cause and the effect of the failure, and that once you've failed, there's no way back. And it's, it's factually, that's not correct. And that's the positive message I would want to send out, that if you're in a spot where you've failed in a relationship or where a relationship has failed, where a job has failed, where you've failed to achieve some sort of financial goal that you've got or some material goal, well, it doesn't mean you've got to give up on it forever. 
it you, means that you just reassess what is achievable within what time scale. Yeah, and I think that's that's a massive thing for a lot of people that they come into some failure or some hardship and then they spiral and out of control. We talked about suicide and that that is losing your job is actually a, a high cause of people that then go on to commit suicide. It's actually taking that time. If you sit down and you write down these learning points, what went wrong, what went right, where can I, you know, cross off the list certain things, that also gives you that cooling off period. You put your brain in a different place. You're not just thinking about the fail of the job getting lost. You're actually setting yourself, oh, well, I actually learned loads there. You can actually see what you've done. So writing that down, writing down what went wrong. Failure is only failure because the way we're educated in school, you get an F, you've done wrong. Whereas in an adult life, failure doesn't mean the same thing. It doesn't. It's a learning curve. You you will find things out about yourself through failure. I love to fail. You know, give me a failure every day, every week, and I'm, I'm learning. So I'm happy. And, and, and sometimes the, the experiences you get when things don't go well actually gives you a greater chance of succeeding in the future because you learn things about yourself. You learn things about interaction with others and about how you should and shouldn't communicate and about what's a realistic expectation and what's unrealistic. And no one's ever made monumental transformational change from a position of perfection. No, it's absolutely, it's absolutely possible. And I'll, I'll say that perfectionism is the absolute epitome or the absolute pinnacle of procrastination because when you're chasing perfectionism you tend to actually do less yeah. you're too fear to make moves you're fear to put stuff out you're fear to put content out i used to hate my voice i never put content out for years because every time i recorded something i hear my voice but oh, i'm not putting that out or oh, that's wrong or that's wrong then i started doing it and people were messaging me saying oh can you do more of those videos you've like, got a great oh. voice mate you're off yeah just i don't know what it was just me personally i didn't like hearing it back and then I thought, oh, it wasn't good enough. I had my own fears, not just failures. I had my own fears of that. And I wasn't, because that's because I was striving for some form of perfectionism, which led to procrastination because I didn't want to do anything then. Yeah. And I, I think the two go hand in hand. So don't, don't strive for perfect. Strive just to do it. Yeah. Realistic, challenging goals. Congratulate yourself when things go well. Don't beat yourself up too much when they don't. That just leads to a, a really, I think, measured, calm mindset and you can enjoy the journey more. I think the journey is the most important part because anytime I get close to the destination, I need to set something else because I don't want to get there because I enjoy that path, you know, and failure and fear is part of that as well. You have to make, you have to make comfortable with it. You have to make it your friend. Yeah, you do. We're going to put the mind, the mind kite link to the app on, on our socials. I really would recommend guys that you check it out um i do think it pulls together um quite a number of well-being and positivity tools which are very user-friendly and which you could use in in, in the day-to-day -day. um so we're going to put that on our socials we're also going to put the the link to your podcast on on our socials now you were talking recently to carol baskin <laughs> who everyone will know from the tiger king documentary on on netflix and and louis threw spoke to her as well what was what was that experience like yeah she was a, an interesting lady um i think that the way that tiger king was edited up was a great show i actually watched it myself i enjoyed it thoroughly yeah so i went in with some expectation of what i thought carol was going to be like she wasn't like that at all she's very articulated she's very clever super intelligent she knows her stuff I even try to ask her some, you know, you know, more difficult questions around tigers and feeding and cages and things like that. And she had answers. She really knows her stuff. And I came away feeling very diff different from what I went in. Um, yeah, if anybody wants to check that out, go and check it out. Go and check. I think Carol's doing quite a lot of podcasts at the minute. Go and check them all out because you'll be surprised at who she actually is as a person. And that also is um, pre prejudging someone. And that, that shows that I did that as well and goes back to what we're talking about, social media and things like that and try not to prejudge people because you actually never really know what they're like, you know? You don't, she came across as a really nice person, but you did a good job as well just in terms of interviewing her because you got you got her talking and, uh, about the right things and it was, it was it was really entertaining. So we're going to put the podcast link on our socials as well, guys. Do you do, do you do that weekly or monthly? 
Yeah, well, we've done two seasons. Um, we're partner Robert Heisey. He does a celebrity-based one. And um, I do inspiring people, inspiring stories. So we've done season one and we're ready to launch season two again. But they're available on, you know, all the usual channels for podcasts and YouTube as well. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly enjoyed the ones I listened to. So check it out, guys. We're nearly reaching a wrap, mates. But I just wanted to ask you to finish off. In terms of this issue of prioritizing well-being, including mental well-being, although you very rightly said that physical well-being and mental well-being go hand in hand, where do you hope we'll be as a society in, say, if we wound the clock on five years? Yeah, I, I want to be around the world. I'm, I'm mentored on speaking by my coach, Les Brown. Um, he's teaching me how to get my voice and build, build my voice up so I can go on stages around the world. And hopefully in five years' time, the message, people like yourself speaking on podcasts, as people like myself, it will positivity breeds positivity. We can hopefully rub off and the next generation, rub off on some more people. Use our social medias in the right way, which will then reach a massive audience real quick and bring people up. I want to see that suicide rate in particular reduced. Oh, all miracles would be zero, but reduced would be a great start. Numbers coming down and not going up because they've went up even during this pandemic, they've went up and it has to come down. In the next five years, that's my vision. The suicide rate, the mental well-being or poor mental well-being rate will come down. People will be accessing the help they need and talking to the right people. That's what it has to be for me in five years. has to be. I hope so. Um, and ending on this point, I think all we can do is keep talking about um, the solutions and to keep talking about the fact that no matter how bad things seem, to use your phrase earlier, they have, everybody has a baseline that they can return to, a platform from which they can move forward. There's always a way forward. And it starts, I think, with talk. It starts with being prepared to have a conversation about how you're feeling. And there's always hope. And rem yeah, and remember, in life, you're not responsible for the whole thing, just your part in it. And if you think on that method, you should go through your day okay. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Mate, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to, no, thank to you welcome you. It's been it. fascinating. Um, so I hope you have all enjoyed it, guys and girls. Um, Jamie's uh, links to Mind Kite and his podcast are on our socials. I've really enjoyed your company, sir. I've really enjoyed the decaf and oat milk. Um I, what, what have you got planned next for your nicest health kick? Are you going to do like a carnivore diet next to I'm knock back at, I'm back at the boxing gym now, so I'm not going to have any fights, but I'm going to up the training a little bit, I think, you know. And it's, winter's a good excuse to pile on the pounds. I'm going to try and do the opposite. I'm going to try and work hard through the winter. Good lad. Well, listen, good luck with that and good luck with everything. Oh, thank so, you very much. Thank you and see you again soon. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.